If you've been enjoying our Impact Podcast and our great guests, then please give us a thumbs up and leave a five-star review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your favorite podcasts. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigeri, and I'm so honored to have with us today Shannon Thomas Carroll. He's the AVP of Global Environmental Sustainability at the iconic and great brand AT&T. Welcome to the Impact Podcast, Shannon. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. Very happy to be here. Um, thank you also for all the work that you do to kind of spread the gospel of corporate social responsibility and sustainability. Um, we are like-minded, and I look forward to the conversation. It's kind of you, and I appreciate that. And it's just real honor to have you on. And and it's this is AT and T's first time on the Impact Podcast for our listeners and viewers, and your first time on, which always makes it fun for me as well as our listeners and viewers. You know, Shannon, before we get talking about all the important work that you're doing with your colleagues at AT and T and environment and sustainability, and um, can you share a little bit about your background, the, the Shannon Thomas Carroll story, where you grew up, and how you even got on this path? Happy to do that. Happy to do that. Um, you know, for me, it's been you know really a, a long and winding road to get here, right? So I, I actually started with uh, I'm from, originally from from San Diego, California. Grew up there, born and raised. Uh, well, I was raised there. I was born in Hawaii, but that's a, a topic for another day. Uh, but San Diego, great city, great town. Still consider it home. Yeah. Um, I've had the fortune of kind of being in Dallas now for several years, and it's a really great city as well. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been with the company for 24 years now. Wow. I've done, um, I work with most of the different parts of the business at some time or another. I actually started out with Pacific Bell, for those of you who may remember that in California. And I started out as a service rep on the consumer side. Um, you know, when you called in and there might have been an issue with your phone bill or you were looking to get call waiting back then, um, I'd be somebody that you would talk to in the call center to make that happen. Wow. So wait a second. So you start off with Pac Bell, but you did get your bachelor's degree in, in sustainability and environmental management. So what what informed you to have that kind of vision back then to get because that wasn't a hot topic when you were back in college. So what was your thinking and what was your vision back then to, you know, go all in on sustainability and environmental management? You know, actually the inspiration in a lot of ways was actually working at at and right? So uh, I'll paint with a broad brush here, right? Coming from California, there's definitely a sense of the environment, you know, the ocean right. is right there, water resources are scarce. So you kind of grow up in this environment of appreciating not only nature, but understanding the resource constrictions that are around you. So that's kind of on the brain, so to speak, as you as you grow up in California. Right. But I, I kind of moved around to the different parts of the business. I, again, I started with the consumer side, uh, then kind of went more to the sales side, worked um, with the, the enterprise business side as well. I worked with the network team, supply chain. And it was really a supply chain. I was there as um, really their compliance manager and just making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, taking the trainings that they're supposed to be taking. And at that time, supply chain also had um, fleet as part of um, its larger business unit. And within fleet, there's a lot of EHS related issues, EHS related issues, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So that was really my, my first professional experience working in terms of um, EHS issues and knowing that ATT had a role to 
play when it come when it came to environmental issues. And it was really that work that led me to find out that AT and T had a corporate social responsibility group who is doing our greenhouse gas inventory, looking at the, our water usage, trying to drive down energy usage. And as soon as I figured out that was happening, I wanted to be a part of it. And I actually did get my, my, my undergraduate in business, but then I, I went to pursue my graduate degree in environmental management and sustainability. And it was because of that, because a, a boss at a time who I thought I was his favorite, um, I went to him and I said, hey, I was like, can I do the sustainability work? And he said, absolutely not. And I said, why not? And he said, because you have no experience or background or education in it. And this is about 12, 13 years ago. Wow. And so maybe longer, 13, 14 years ago. Right. And so at that point, I just decided, you know what? I, I, you know, I don't know a lot about this academically. I haven't done a lot of the work professionally outside of, you know, some of the eh and issues I had the opportunity to work on. And so I just went and found a graduate program and started doing the work, started sharing my grades in every class. And mm. about a year and a half in, he said, OK, OK, leave me alone. You can do the work. And I really started my, my sustainability career um, within the global supply chain for AT&T, doing a lot of work on not only the environmental side, but the social side for human rights and labor practice. As you can imagine, with a, a large supply chain, those, those issues exist. So that's really where I cut my teeth. And. And I, I, I just worked a lot with the corporate sustainability team at that time. And I transitioned over as soon as I had the opportunity and, and been doing the focusing on the environmental sustainability at at and ever since. That's wonderful. And for our listeners and viewers, to find Shannon and his colleagues and all the important work they're doing at at and you can go to their website and check it out, at and backslash CSR. I'm on their website now. It is chock full of information and important, um, uh, you know, things that they're up to. And we're going to get into that now. You know, Shannon, here's the sort of the, the, the curse and the blessing of what I've learned along the way in interviewing almost 2,000 people over the last uh, 16 years or so. ESG, sustainability, and the word environmental sustainability can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So you're, you know, you know sitting on top of, a very large uh, organization and opportunity. How do you choose and pick what goals and what topics you're going to work towards uh, in any given annual year and and forecast that out in three years and five years as well? So, I, you know, the first thing we do, right, is, is what is material to the business? And that sounds really simple, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into that. Right. And within the CSR organization, under our chief sustainability officer, Charlene Lake, we, we do a materiality assessment every, every two to three years. So it's important, right? It's not just AT&T's perspective on what we should be working on. Right. It's an extra stakeholder perspective as well. So that informs a lot of what we do. At the end of the day, we're a connectivity company, right? So a lot of the work that we're going to do is around that. Um, and I have colleagues that can talk all day on, on some of the social work that we do and it's great work around the digital divide and education and volunteering and, and the philanthropic work philanthropic work that we do. Uh, my focus is on the environment. I have, I would argue, the best environmental sustainability team out there that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis that make me look good. But yeah, to get to your point again, is it's really like we figure out what's material to the business. What do we have an impact on? Um, and, and then we really go from there. And as you said, it's, it's you know, we have lots of projects that might go year to year, but we're always looking out on the long term. Sure. So, you know, we're constantly trying to figure out, you know, what is next, um, trying to read the tea leaves, so to speak, in, in terms of what should we be working on in the next two or three years. Um, and as you know, in this world of sustainability, environmental sustainability in particular, um, it's all about long term goals. Right. There's very few quick wins in this world, um, you know, and when you, when you get an opportunity to seize them, you do so. Um, but when you look at, you know, for example, our carbon neutral goal, right, and, and, and several companies have something similar, whether it's net zero carbon neutral, ours would be carbon neutral by uh, 2035. Right. And that's important in and of itself to have that goal, have that long term goal that kind of informs the entire business right on where we should be going to reduce our emissions. Um, but to me, that's only part of it. The other thing that we take very seriously is, is making sure that we're transparent in how we meet those goals. 
and the credibility of that goal. And for us, the credibility part comes in because we have an underlying science-based target, right, that supports that. So we report out annually on our progress towards that goal um, and make sure it's within the scientific consensus of what we should be doing from an emission reduction perspective. You know, first of all, going back to your education, talk about a guy who was right place, right time. You're your uh, foresight in choosing your path forward in terms of your graduate studies is, is just almost impeccable. Because when I think back, uh, Shannon, back in 04, 03, when I was just launching my recycling company, A, there was no such thing as an iPhone back then. There didn't exist. Al Gore hadn't come out with Inconvenient Truth. And we didn't have the beginnings of our sustainability push yet here in America. And as we well know, Europe's culturally and from a DNA perspective, probably two generations ahead of us when it comes to sustainability, environmental sustainability, ESG, and um, and even the circular economy, as is South Korea and probably Japan as well, mostly because they're small countries, very limited uh, land supply. So it wasn't just uh, 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 you know a, a go and throw type of landfill situation, but um, you know, you are now, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of what is seems like the, one of the biggest uh, trends in American business history in terms of the rise of the, 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 the shift from the linear to circular economy. ESG is for sure here to stay. And the sustainability revolution and environmental protections here to stay, whereas you and I didn't really grow up in grade school with good recycling or environmental practices. We know now you know our children, both in you know uh, their schooling and in their and in their general life practices, are being inundated with good information on how to be more responsible citizens. So my hats off to you for ch- you know for choosing such a great career path. Number one, number two, as you said, you're looking at things from a long term perspective. I don't think anything could be more short term and long term as is climate change. So when you're focused on climate change, Shannon, how are you? And 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 your colleagues at AT and T approaching that very um, uh, media centric topical issue, which is of course affecting us all because the weather patterns throughout this whole great country we live in have shifted everywhere we are and look nothing like they looked fifteen or twenty years ago. Right. Yeah. So first, I appreciate your perspective on the on the profession that that I yeah. found my way to. Great. And I'll, you know, they say luck is where preparation meets opportunity, right? So <laughs> I have to be prepared. And I, you know, I get asked this a lot. Um, we talk to a lot of college students on a pretty regular basis and you know, say, how do you get into this work? What, what do you do? And the first thing is you have to have a passion for it. I do believe that. Look, if you're going to work in the corporate world or the business acumen, you have to have. And that's why, you know, I, I got my bachelor's in business. That's important, right, to understand the, you know, the world and, and, and the nomenclature, right, that you're going to be surrounded by. Um, but if you don't have a passion for this, right, you can't assume everybody else is going to. So it's really up to us in the sustainability profession to, to kind of drive drive these things. So uh, I love the work that I do. Um, in terms of climate change, you know, we have a very holistic view, right? So anytime you're looking at climate change, there's definitely two sides of the coin, right? There's the mitigation side, the emission reduction side, and the adaptation side. How, how are we going to prepare? You know, so from that lens, right, it's really kind of three-pronged approach for us. So the first thing that we do is is talking about the carbon neutral goal, right? That's really about how do we mitigate, how do we reduce our own impact? Right. Right. Largely around emissions for us, because uh, it'll be to nobody's surprise that we use a lot of electricity to power a network, right? A global network like we do. Right. So, you know, making sure that we're participating in renewable energy markets, energy efficiency, like that is something we're always going to have to do um, as not only, you know, to show our commitment to the environment, but just as good business practices at this point. So reducing our own emissions is, is going to be a, a big part of that. The second thing is, again, we talked earlier about, you know, at the end of the day, AT&T is a connectivity company. So how do you leverage that? And can you leverage that? Mm. We're actually very fortunate that, you know, it's you're hard pressed to think an environmental sustainability solution in the future that's not going to include connectivity. Um, if we wanted to just rest on that, we could, but that's not what we're trying to do. You know, we have a very concerted effort to help our business customers reduce their emissions as well. Again, there are like-minded companies that also have carbon neutral, uh, net zero, you know, emission reduction goals, and we can help them do that, right? One of the ways that we do that is, you know, just offering 
one of many smart climate solutions is what we call them, um, that, that we can offer any of our business customers to help reduce their emissions. But we even go beyond that. Um, we have a public goal to reduce our customer, our business customer emissions by one gigaton. That's one billion metric tons. And we're very transparent in that, right? Again, I think it's one thing to set a goal, but for us, we show you how all the sauces is made, right? We actually show what the methodology is. We report out on it annually. It is open for anybody and everybody to look at and question how we're doing that. And we, we invite that and want that um, because again, you know, credibility is really important when you, when you do something like this. Um, and along those lines with the Gigaton Smart Climate Solutions, we have a concerted effort. It's something we call the Connected Climate Initiative. And the idea is that we want like-minded customers uh, who are also trying to minimize their environmental impact to come and work with us, right? And take mm -hmm. what we do best and what they do best, and then how do we maximize those two things for emission reduction, right? Mm -hmm. And a positive, you know, kind of business plan as well. So, you know, we... This is all in the public domain. We gave the website. There's lots of information there. We have lots of case studies. Very lucky to work with companies like Microsoft, Salesforce, Deloitte. We love all of our Connected Climate Initiative folks the same, um, but we have lots of great participation there. And then the final side, and, and those first two mechanisms really are about the mitigation, driving down global emissions, whether it's ours or our, our business customers. The other thing that you have to address or it's incomplete is really the adaptation side or the climate resiliency side, right? It's no longer that, hey, you know, climate change is going to affect us in the future. No, it's affecting us now. And we know that you can ask the city of Houston, right? They've had several hundred year floods just over the last few years. Right. So what are you going to do to prepare your physical infrastructure for the inevitable impacts of these extreme weather events? And again, weather is just what's happening today and climate is weather over time. You know, for us, there's, you know, a big part of it is we have a significant physical infrastructure in the ground, right? So we have obviously cell towers, we have fiber, we have central offices, all these things that we need to look at. So what we're doing is we're taking the best available client data that we can get our hands on, and we actually do two things with it internally. One, and I think what's the most powerful thing is we actually have already implemented into our network design and planning tools, right? So what that means is as at and is building out tomorrow's network, it already has climate risk scores. It already has climate data as part of that design and planning. So we can be better prepared um, as we decide where to put things and how to, how to build them out for these extreme weather events. The other thing that we're doing is looking at what we have in the ground today, right? So where is the central office that may be a little more susceptible to flooding? And, and once we identify that, then we can take steps, right, to, mid, to, to adapt and, and put solutions in there to protect that central office. because. Think about this from an extreme weather perspective. What's the first thing, other than your own personal safety, everybody does? They pick up their cell phones and they want to call their family to tell them they're okay. Or they want to call their family to see if they're okay. And we take right. that responsibility very seriously. So having a, a network that is prepared for climate change is, is really, really important. Um, but we don't stop there, right, on the climate data. What we do and what we did recently through a continued collaboration with Argonne National Labs, who we've been you know, working with to get our climate data for, for many years now. We're also working with FEMA, and AT&T just launched along with FEMA and Argonne National Labs. Uh, it's called CLIMER, the Climate um, Resilience uh, Portal, Risk and Resilience Portal, and that's C-L-I-M-R-R, -R, CLIMER. We love our acronyms, right, in this world. Right. So it, it's a CLIMER, it's, it's a collaboration between AT&T, Argonne, and FEMA. And really, that's so impactful because it allows you know, public officials, community leaders who might not have easy access to climate data, um, it gives them a very easy portal to go through and get access. So think if you're an emergency planner for, for a local municipality, you're not sure which bridge needs to be reinforced. You're not sure which um, roads are gonna be impacted by extreme flooding in the future. Uh, we've helped provide that data with Argonne National Labs and now through that FEMA portal, um, you can go in and, and you can start looking at that, whether you're just a community kind of advocate or you're an emergency manager in the local municipality. Um, it's for everybody and, and folks can go and get that data today. For our listeners and viewers who just joined us, we've got Shannon Thomas Carroll with us. He's the AVP of Global Environmental Sustainability at at and to find Shannon and his great colleagues and the important work they're doing, please go to at and backslash CSR. So wait a second now. What I'm what I should have answered earlier is how you know. Obviously, you have your offices in Dallas, but 
how many offices does AT&T you know, have in, in nationally and internationally potentially, and how many employees? Just so we can understand the size and scope of what you're doing and uh, how how big this uh, you know organization really is. Yeah, so I'll I'll paint with a broad brush here, right? Some round yeah. numbers. We have we yeah. have hundreds, obviously, of kind of what you think of the large, big kind of offices right. throughout the United States and, and international as well. But we have thousands, tens of thousands, right, of of smaller buildings. Think of again, you know, sometimes you'll drive by in the neighborhood and you'll see kind of that square beige building with an AT&T logo. That's a central office. That's really important because all of the fiber, everything that's from a communication perspective, on, uh, whether it's on the fiber side or the mobile side, is coming through that central office. So the importance of making sure that works is really important. You walk through your neighborhood with your dog and you'll probably walk by a little green box, right? That's also the type of equipment that we look at. So it's tens of thousands of pieces of equipment and small offices, hundreds and hundreds of, of larger buildings. Um, we do have a global footprint. You know, our first foray into this is really on the domestic side because um, that's where we can get the best climate data. So what we've done is actually, this started as a pilot. And, uh, and, and just to answer your question as well, I don't know the exact number, but I know we're just over 200,000 employees. Right. That's point. huge. So wow. we're, we're a pretty big company. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we started as a pilot and, you know, we didn't know necessarily what we were doing um, when we started our climate change, our climate change journey. Right. Um, sure. We had a lot of smart people internally, right? A lot of resources, technical resources we could take advantage of. But we weren't climate scientists as much as I like to think I know. I am not a climate scientist. So we said, OK, let's find some climate scientists to work with. Let's find some good climate data. And we did that through Argonne. We launched this in the southeast. Right, so Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, very susceptible to extreme weather events and said, okay, let's see if we can figure this out in a small geographic area. And the idea then was, hey, let's just get what the extreme um, weather is gonna be from a flooding, so that's both, both coastal inland, extreme wind as well. Um, and let's see what we can do in terms of um, identifying where our risk is because what happens is just instinctively and, and, and maybe just through, you know, historically, what you want to do is say, okay, everything along the coast, let's protect that. Everything inland maybe needs less protection from a hurricane perspective. But as you look at the data and you let the data drive your decision making, and you combine that with the historical, don't, don't get me wrong. But when you look at that, you realize like, oh, not everything on the coast is equally susceptible or at risk to extreme weather events. So what that allows you to do is free up some resources and allocate them somewhere else because all resources are finite, right? No matter right. what they are. So, you right. know, we, we did that. And, we, and honestly, it was a long haul to do that. Um, but we were able to make it work. And once we were able to make it work, we just launched it through the contiguous 48, right, for the entire United States. So now we have that view for the entire United States. And, and it was really important for us, too, to not just look at, hey, extreme weather events on the coast. We really want to make sure we're looking at the middle of the United States. I mean, because we have a footprint everywhere. So coastal flooding is often what you'll see on the news, but inland flooding is just can be just as damaging, is just as important. You know, extreme wind can be just as important. Drought information is something we have. That's very important depending on the region that you're in. So now we have all of these different, you know, categories of climate data that we can look at. And again, water impacts. A fiber connection very differently than it impacts a cell tower, right? Right. Heat impacts um, a cooling tower very differently than it impacts a building. So we now have the ability to do that right throughout our domestic footprint um, and just be better informed to protect our, our our network and not only our network but our operations overall. It's we started using it for strictly network purposes, but we now have the ability to use it beyond that, right? So think retail stores, right? You know, are they susceptible? We want to make sure their customers have access to them and where do we make decisions in terms of those locations? So there's lots of different things um, that you can do with this data. And as you can see, I'm very excited about it. And uh, it's it's really been a, a game changer for us at at and Well, what also what I hear when, when, you're, when you're talking about all the great programs you have, you started your career in the supply chain side uh, you know, and you got very familiar with supply chain, which is very important to the inward facing operations of what you do at AT&T. And you figured out 
goals in sustainability environment there. Then you also now focus on the outward and empower your, your clients and your users to also get very involved and also make better and more informed decisions. How is that balancing act done by you and your colleagues in terms of when you when you have your own limited resources of your time and your and your your leadership team's time of, you know, do we focus on inward operations this month or outward? And how is that toggle, you know, work on a regular month, monthly, quarterly, and annual basis for you at AT and T? So you know, there's 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 as you can imagine, lots of moving parts when you're making those decisions. But yeah. one thing we talk about is is can we do this at scale? Can we replicate this? Oh. Very early on when we were looking at the climate data, you know, 30 seconds, you know, into it, you're, you're thinking like, oh, this is great. Like we're going to have the, the best climate data. As far as we knew at the time, we we're the only ones doing it. Um, but then, you know, you talk to your chief sustainability officer and she says, hey, you know, climate change is where we collaborate. Going through, right. And so, and why that's important is, it doesn't do AT&T any good if we're climate resilient in a vacuum. I've said this before and I'll continue to say it. We need everybody, right? All the communities, our value chain, we need everybody to be climate resilient, right? right. And to be prepared. Because it's one of those things in, in this world, you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? So we've had folks ask us like, hey, you're putting your climate data out there, but what about your competitors? Please go out there and get this. The great thing is the data itself comes from Argonne National Lab, right? This is you know, not AT&T climate scientists. This is an independent organization, part of the DOE. Does a lot of the climate modeling, you know, for the for the government already, and you know they have the best North American climate model out there. So from that perspective, why not? Even though we funded that and and, and you know gave them the ability to to and really I'll just say this when when it comes to kind of our participation and working with Argon, how it really came together is again they have the expertise from a from a climate modeling perspective, but what they were doing is they were getting climate data and it gave you one point covering 12 kilometers. And that was world-class at the time. But you talk to a network engineer about making a decision on the network for one data point over 12 kilometers, that's a short conversation, right? They need something actionable. And what we do is we call it neighborhood level climate data. And that's really what we funded Argon uh, National Lab to do is to give us that climate or th that neighborhood level climate data. So when it comes to coastal flooding, we're able to get data points within a few meters. When it comes to inland flooding, we're now at 200 meters and we're trying to work to get even closer than that. So, you know, we need actionable climate data. You know, the other thing that we do in terms of, you know, what do we work on? The first thing we want to do is make sure we're doing something that we have some expertise around, right? Like, you know, why are we working on something that we can't, you know, provide, right, any value to? So we, we want to provide expertise. We want to, as much as possible, to make it as simple as possible, right? And we get into climate data, sometimes there can be challenges, um, but we're trying to make that as simple as possible for people to use. And an example of that would be Climber. You can go on and just look at maps if you're not in the data. Um, and then we want to be inspirational, right? Like, how do we motivate others to do what we're doing, just like we've been motivated by what others do, right? And so this is an area we should, where we should all steal shamelessly from each other when it comes to no. our ideas around environmental sustainability and the best the best path to get there that's a brilliant point you know you know i'm so glad you said that shannon in terms of this is not a zero-sum game we want everyone to succeed because we're all in this boat together the environment has no borders so we don't want anyone you know liquidating the environment or doing any harms we want to we want all the you know, the ocean to go up so all the boats go up so speaking of that what serves what continues to inspire you in terms of when you benchmark all the great work you're doing at at t with your colleagues in environmental sustainability. Where do you look for, how do I say this the right way, future guidance on not where the puck is today, as, as Gretzky used to say, but where the puck is going in environmental sustainability? That's right. I'm not a big hockey guy, but I know Gretzky's the goal. <laughs> Neither am I. But... I know that much. Uh, so, you know, some of the inspiration – you, you really have to split your focus in a good way, right? So you want to take advantage of, of what's happening within your own ecosystem, within at and And we have, you know, so many people now that are focused on this, you know, that, that again, quite frankly, make my, my job very easy, right? So a few years ago, there was one person working on climate resiliency. Now there are, you know, two full-time people, and, and that's full-time plus 
right? We have lots of other folks supporting us with either most of or some of their time, right? So there's, you know, in all actuality working on, you know, time and resiliency right now, there's, you know, several people, you know, if not double digits, right? And then you have the same version of that happening. You know, we're doing more and more on the consumer side, right? How do we help our consumers be more environmentally sustainable? And as we go into the business units, we're starting to raise their hand and say, you know what? We've been waiting for somebody to ask us this question. You know, we have this idea there. When we work with, you know, and again, we're highly dependent on our business unit to make things happen, right? The various business unit partners to make things happen. You know, so when we go and work with AT&T's energy team within the network, you know, we need them to co-sign everything that we do, right? Um, they're the experts, right, on how to run the network, how to make it more energy efficient. So, and there's a lot of times that their day-to-day -day job is making sure that network is the most resilient network in the world, right? But a lot of them have great thoughts and inspiration about how to do it in a, in a more in, you know, environmentally friendly way or more energy efficient way. So we're able to collaborate on that. And, and really, that's happening now in all aspects, including you know, even with that Connected Climate Initiative, right? So we think we have this great idea to bring people together. And one of our, our collaborators come and say, have you guys thought about doing it this way? And we go, well, no, but we will now, right? So right. you have to take advantage of all the, the internal um, kind of resources that you have, the, the human resources that you have, and then look at like you have to look at what your peers are doing, what your competitors are doing, what's happening beyond your industry. Even I think right. a lot of times within the larger ICT industry, you know, we we all look at each other as we should. And you know, what I encourage you know my team and myself to do is look beyond that. Right? What are other industries doing? And is right. they doing something? Are they considering something that? Maybe we haven't considered today, um, but we should be considering tomorrow, right? So it's 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 really bold. You know, um, I, I, I'm on your website now. And again, for our listeners and viewers, your website's just great in terms of the information. ATT.com backslash CSR. I, I'm looking at your July 22 uh, impact report and uh, ESG report, actually. Um, what, how much, speaking of resources and teamwork, and vision, how much time from your team goes into assisting the others and the other divisions into that ESG summary uh, that you guys publish every year? So that is a, a big lift, right? Um, and yeah, the ESG summary, the CSR summary, as we call it, um, that's an annual report that we do uh, for a lot of different reasons, right? So one, you know, we have a lot of external stakeholders, including investors, who want to know what is AT&T doing on all these important issues. Right. So it's good to have, you know, a place for everybody to go. But we also have, um, you know, beyond that, just, you know, there's there's no limited number, that, right? There's there's infinite number of external stakeholders doing different things that are just interested in this, right? So, you know, we want to make sure that that's available in terms of the time and the effort that it takes. You know, it's 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 essentially a year long process. Right. When you think about it, kind of preparing for it and everything that you need. You know, my team plays a large role in the sense that a lot of the data from the environmental side is obviously coming from my team. And we're working with the business units to get that. So think of the greenhouse gas inventory report. What are we reporting out on scope one, scope two, scope three? Because we do it all. Um, but there's also, you know, a, a lot of other um, uh, contributors, you know, just from the aspect of. So if you go into that report, which I encourage everybody to do. You know, again, it's going to talk a lot about what we're doing on the digital divide, right? From the social side, that's really important. And, you know, we can play a significant role in closing the digital divide in this company. So, you know, we have all types of business union partners and the CSR organization that, that is doing that. The heavy lift um, actually comes from a colleague of mine, Jason Liker and his team. They are responsible for herding all the cats, you know, and, uh, and getting everything together. Um, and produce it in a way that's easily digestible right. as well. I think sometimes the danger is, you know, the environmental sustainability work gets really complicated really fast. Right. Uh, and the onus is on us, right, as professionals to make it easily easier to understand, right, by the average person who has some interest in this. And we can't assume that everybody's a sustainability professional that's looking at right. this. Jason's team does an outstanding job of making it very readable, very user friendly. Um, very narrative in its approach. There's all the data you could possibly want in there, uh, but we want to make sure again, folks that are that are reading that, whether you're a high level investor who knows a lot about this, right. or maybe undergrad or high school student who's wondering what corporate corporations are doing around this, it's it's accessible by by each. 
That's that's brilliant because, like you said, these very sophisticated analysts and institutional investors out there, but there's a man or woman on the street that loves AT and T, uses your services, and wants to know, you know, who they're supporting, who they're writing checks to. Um, so that's a that comes out every July. It's an annual event that comes out every July. Correct. And right. we're, we're we're ready to launch the the new one very very soon. That's exciting. And you know, um, you know, Shannon, as you and I know, there's no finish line in the uh, sustainability race in the sustainability journey. So can you share, give us a little bit of um, things that get you out of bed in the morning and what, what's to come for at ts innovative sustainability journey? So, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it all, but I probably have a problem. Um, so I, I love <laughs> think about something like, um, you know, I've been with the company 24 years, but I plan to be here when we meet our carbon neutral goal, right? So that's awesome. Be sure that we're consistently making that, you know, making progress towards that, um, and that we're challenging to do things way, you know, to do things in a way beyond that we've normally done. And when we say innovation specifically, right? I just think there's so much, um, and a lot of the technology exists today, but I think there's so much untapped um, opportunity around IoT. Right and around the connect, you know, the connectivity with that, whether it's you know 5G or or edge networks and things of that nature. But so think about a world where you know every device that consumes energy has the ability to report real time on the energy usage. You know that's not only important from a reporting perspective; it's also important because if you're managing managing a corporation like AT and T with thousands and thousands of assets. Um, and you pay a really large energy bill, right? That that all these pieces of equipment consume. Being able to spot in real time some kind of anomaly, like this piece of equipment X is running 30% or is using 30% more energy than it normally would, and being able to get in there and make adjustments, do preventive maintenance, make fix uh, or make fixes to that um, in real time, right? When you look at that in aggregate, that may not be a big footprint for that piece of equipment. But when you look at that in aggregate, that's potentially millions of dollars in savings, millions of tons of emissions, right? And then you go beyond AT&T, right? Think of almost anything out there, whether it's a, a waste dumpster, right? How often they get dumped. You throw an IoT sensor on there, you can right. better right. You can figure out exactly when to dump it, not just every Thursday, but when it's full. Like how many resources do you save by doing that? You know, think about, you know, a, a manufacturing plant that has, you know, various pieces of equipment in there. Something goes wrong on the assembly line. And again, you have that real-time instant connectivity IoT solution that says, hey, something just went wrong. You can go fix that. So I think like real-time, um, not only data, but real-time reporting of data. Anytime you can look at real-time energy data, you can also look at real-time emissions data. So if you're particularly focused on your emissions, um, mm. We should all be focused on the cost, and there's, we should never be ashamed to say that. Right. But if you're also looking at the, you know, reducing your emissions, and you see something is even if it's a minimum cost to your, your company in terms of the amount of energy that machine is using, what if it's a high emissions machine? Right. You can immediately identify that, correct it, and make sure that you're not, you know, you don't have too many emissions on that piece of equipment. And then again, you do that aggregate on a global scale. You know, to me, that's that's really innovative. And, and even we go beyond that, we talk about the carbon market a lot, right? Think about a scenario in which, you know, carbon direct air capture is becoming a very real thing. You know, when you do that, you need to validate it, you need to monitor it, you need to track it. You're going to do that through connectivity and IoT sensors, right? And think about a world where you actually have real-time carbon offsets being generated and sold. You know, so I think from that perspective, you know, there's a lot of this technology exists. I just think there's, so much opportunity to, to kind of start using it on a mass scale. And once we start doing that, we'll figure out new solutions beyond that as well. Well, I'm going to just tell you something. I, I, I love your goal of being at at t Shannon, when, when you guys hit all your, your net zero goals and everything else you're working on. And what I want to offer to you is I want you to come back as often as you want, come back every year or more and share the progress you're making at at t um, because it's so important that others hear, like you said in the beginning, in the beginning, it's always, uh, a, it's a tough start. You don't know where to begin and you don't know how it's going to go, but people just got to get on the sustainability journey and just put one foot in front of the other and get going because 
it's fun once you get going. As I can see here with just you and all the amazing things you get to do every day, there's never a boring day. But I just want to thank you again for coming on the show. You're beyond inspirational. Shannon Thomas, Thomas Carroll, the AVP of Global Environmental Sustainability at at t Please check him and his colleagues and all the important work they're doing in environmental sustainability out at www.attnt.com backslash CSR. Shannon, thank you for the impact you're making on this planet. Thank you for making the world a better place. And I can't wait to have you back on the Impact Podcast show. Right. Thanks, John. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. <laughs>